didn't know till today that there's evidence from years ago that there's something there. Europa is one of the most fascinating bodies in the solar system. We think beneath its icy surface is a global ocean, twice the volume of all of Earth's oceans combined. In the late 1990s, the Galileo spacecraft explored the Jupiter system. It made about a dozen flybys of Europa. It took observations from its cameras and from its magnetometer. By discovering that there was an induced magnetic field at Europa, we were led to the conclusion that there must be an ocean just beneath the icy surface of the moon. But there were some strange signatures in the magnetic field that we had never really been able to account for. Images of Europa from the Hubble Space Telescope have hinted at gases that might have come from plumes erupting at Europa. The Hubble images had given an estimate of the height and width, and I knew how fast Galileo was moving relative to Europa. There are better tools now, better computational techniques, better computing, that we can go back and look at that old data set anew. So uh, my colleague Shinja Jha set up a calculation to see what would happen in the environment of Europa if there were such a plume. And when he ran this simulation, it agreed just beautifully with the data that we had collected. Reanalysis of the Galileo magnetometer data suggests that the Galileo spacecraft and its closest flyby of Europa flew through a plume. The Europa Clipper mission is going to explore Europa to investigate its habitability. If we find active plumes, then we can sail on through them and sniff and taste that stuff that's in the plume. We can analyze the particles and the gases to get at the detailed composition of Europa's interior. Good afternoon, I'm Lori Glaze, the acting director of the Planetary Science Division at NASA. And I'm really excited to be here today talking with planetary scientists about this recent result uh, confirming plumes on Europa. Um, I'm joined today by my co-pilot, uh, Joanna Wendell. Uh, Joanna is a communications specialist here at NASA. And to my left is Dr. Elizabeth Turtle uh, from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Uh, Zibby uh, is interested in the moons of the planets in the outer part of our solar system. To Zibi's left, we don't have her yet, but we have uh, uh, Dr. Shinja Jia, who uh, led the research that we just saw about in that video. And Shinja is from the University of Michigan, and he's interested in magnetic and plasma environments on the planets and their moons. Um, and I'm hoping we'll also be joined by uh, Dr. Margaret Kivelson uh, from the University of California, Los Angeles, and she was a scientist on the Galileo mission um, and she led the magnetometer investigation uh, that discovered the ocean on Europa. So uh, with that, I think I'd like to toss it over to Joanna, and would you like to kick off this discussion? Yes, I would. Uh, this is a super exciting um, new line of evidence for uh, Europa plumes, which is awesome, but uh, I think before we really get into the nitty-gritty of these findings, we should really uh, back up a little bit and um, figure out what is Europa and, what, you know, where is it? <laughs> uh, Europa is one of the large moons of Jupiter, mm -hmm. the planet Jupiter. Um, it's somewhat smaller than our moon, mm -hmm. um, and out at Jupiter's distance from the sun, Europa's surface is covered in ice, wow. in water ice. Yeah. But beneath that water ice layer, there's evidence that there's a liquid water ocean. Wow. Which is really exciting. That is so exciting, and it's so far away from the sun, so we know it's covered in ice, but how does, how does an ocean survive out there, a liquid ocean survive way out there? Well, there's, a, the there's an interaction um, between the different moons of Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, Io, which is the closest moon to Jupiter, Europa, 
and then Ganymede. Mm -hmm. And they're in what's called a resonance, yeah. which means kind of like when you're pushing someone on a swing, yeah. every time they come back, you give them a little more yeah. push. And the moons do the same cool. thing to each other in their in their orbits. Mm -hmm. And that actually generates a lot of energy. Wow. So Io has silicate volcanoes, just wow. like Kilauea that's yeah. erupting right now. Yeah. Right. Um, and as you move further out, the moons get progressively colder. Okay. So Europa has still has an icy surface, yeah. but a liquid water uh, ocean underneath, um, okay. a fairly thin ice shell. And as you get out to Ganymede, there's a thicker ice shell, okay. but also with uh, a liquid water okay. ocean interior. But the in heat the keeps the water liquid beneath exactly. the icy crust. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then what is a plume? So, um, one of the one of the questions that we've had about mm -hmm. Europa with this this fairly shallow ocean yeah. is whether or not there's current activity at the surface. Mm -hmm. And one way that kind of activity can manifest itself is is by what we call cryovolcanism, oh. which is cold volcanism. Whoa! And we see that <laughs> at um, Saturn's moon, yeah. Enceladus, okay. where there are large plumes. Right. Of right. liquid water and ice particles that are jetting out of the the south pole of Enceladus. Yeah. But it's been a long-standing question yeah. as to whether we have that kind of activity at Europa as yeah. well. Yeah. Oh my God. I mean, that's so. Like, how do you how do you even go about trying to find plumes? I mean, what what are the different techniques we've used to even find these things? I mean, either of you can. I don't know. Maybe Shunjab could yeah. talk a little bit about. Yeah. yeah, I mean, of course, from telescopes, uh, you could observe uh, mm -hmm. the existence of potential plumes. So that was actually uh, being done back a few years ago when uh, Hubble first sent back images in 2012. And the scientists have found, you know, hints that those images might contain signatures of potential plumes yeah. at the Europa. A couple of years later, they obtained further images and actually saw um, plumes occurring potentially at other locations mm -hmm. from the first detection. Mm -hmm. So telescopic observation certainly is a very useful, valuable tool uh, to search for plumes. Um, I just wanted to interrupt for a second. When you say that uh, that Hubble sent back images, I mean, are we talking about you know a can you know point and shoot <laughs> image, and we see the the vapor you know sort of cloudy? I mean, when you when you say image, what are we actually seeing with our eyes in this image? Yeah, so there are, there are two kinds of, I think, techniques that are being used so far from, uh, from Hubble. Mm -hmm. uh, one, the first, I think, first set of emissions, uh, images taken by Hubble, we're looking at the emissions of uh, molecules uh, being striked by electrons okay. that would generate emissions, and those emissions at the specific wavelengths will be captured by Hubble. And mm -hmm. the follow-up... Kind of like the aurora in our atmosphere? Is that yes, a similar process? Yes, yeah, similar process. And the follow-up observation from Hubble, I believe, was looking at actual absorption of um, uh, atmosphere water molecules mm -hmm. of, of the uh, lights. So, mm -hmm. so the two different kinds of techniques are so far being used to look for plumes. Okay. Okay. Cool. So should we, but how did we discover them this time? So mm -hmm. this is uh, what I understand is that we now, we knew that there were plumes, or we believed there were plumes from the Hubble observations. Um, but you and your team went back and looked at the older data from the prior mission from Galileo. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Galileo mission? Or maybe Margaret can tell us a little bit about the, the Galileo mission and the instrument that she led mm -hmm. um, there. Yeah. Yeah, let's get let's get Margaret. Can we get Margaret. Hello. On here. Hi. 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 Can you tell us Hi. a little bit about the Galileo mission and the magnetometer instrument and investigation? Uh, I I love to talk about the Galileo <laughs> mission and the uh, magnetometer instrument. So the Galileo mission uh, reached Jupiter in 1995 and was there for eight years in orbit for spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter, and one of the key parts of the mission was to make close flybys of the four large moons of Jupiter. And uh, there were 11 flybys of Europa, uh, and in a flyby, uh, the time uh, close to the moon is of particular interest because that changes the way in which the charged particle gases in the vicinity of the moon um, uh, move, it slows them down, it diverts the flows and changes the magnetic field. And so for each pass, we looked at changes 
in the magnetic field that uh, were associated with approaching uh, the moon. And uh, on one particular pass by Europa, uh, the spacecraft uh, came very, very close to the surface, less, as I remember, less than 150 kilometers above the surface. Uh, and it was on that uh, pass that we saw signatures that we never really understood. So I don't know if you want me to go on at this point. Or... <laughs> well, no, that was great. So my That's question, helpful, thank you. Yeah, so my question then would be, what inspired you to go back into this, what, 20 year old data, right? You know, there was this signature that maybe you never understood, but what was the thing that made you go, oh, maybe we should check that out again? And you know, either um, uh, Shinja or Margaret can address. Well, you can start, Shinja. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> And I think really we're largely inspired by those Hubble detections uh, mm -hmm. published back a few years ago. Mm -hmm. As I remember, um, almost exactly a year ago, uh, we had a Europa Clipper Project Science Group meeting in Columbia, Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, the fifth meeting we had. Uh, so all the team scientists were gathering together and talking about science related to Europa. And one of our colleagues, Melissa McGrath, mm -hmm. so she was showing um, a summary of all the available Hubble images we had so far of Europa uh, potential plume detection. And the latest paper was just published about months before this meeting. So she was talking about you know um, the locations of potential plumes uh, in those images, mm -hmm. and that is the moment that really I think led us to realize that we had to go back to look at Galileo data because one of the flybys, as Margaret just mentioned, um, had a closest approach altitude that's just a couple hundred kilometers above the surface mm -hmm. in the region that is very close to the repeat plume detection by Hubble. Mm. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, what are the chances? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Wow. Um, uh, so what I want to do is sort of uh, paint a word picture here. Um, flying through a plume. I mean, what is this plume? What do we think it looks like? I mean, are we talking about like a paper airplane flying over old faithful <laughs> geyser in, in Yellowstone? I mean, what do we think is going on there? Um, well, it would, be, it would be very tenuous. You'd be able mm -hmm. to sense it. Clearly, Galileo sensed it, yeah. but Galileo didn't see it. Okay. Um, so the... Um, so optically, it's it's not necessarily uh, very optically thick. Okay, um, is, is how okay. we'd refer to it. There are not a lot of a lot of particles, which is good. Um, since Galileo yeah. Yeah. Yes. Through, it didn't get it. Right. shot, you know, yeah. out of orbit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we do have some again yeah. some example from the Cassini spacecraft mm -hmm. that did observations mm -hmm. of Enceladus and its plume. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the the imaging observations, if you look at the plume, if you look at Enceladus and hopefully Europa, yep. when the sun is on the other side, so mm -hmm. you're kind of looking through the plume yeah. at the sun, yeah. the scattering yeah, by yeah. particles in the plume makes okay. them, make them stand out very well. Okay. We have mm -hmm. beautiful observations okay. um, of the plumes of Enceladus, and yeah. that's something that we hope to do in the future yeah. uh, with, uh, with Europa as well. And mm -hmm. so cool. Slightly silly question, could it have seen a rainbow? Like in the mist, like is, the, is there like enough mist here that maybe it, they could, any, any kind of plume fly, I could see a rainbow. I've always wondered that. I don't know that there's enough signal at the different, at the different the wavelengths, wavelengths right. to be able okay. to right. pull that out. But we will, yeah. with uh, Europa Clipper, look at <laughs> plumes with a variety mm -hmm. of wavelengths. Awesome. So uh, yeah. stay tuned. Maybe our first <laughs> interplanetary rainbow yeah. coming up. And presumably you'll do the same sort of experiment where you can put the sun behind the plume and, and see it and perhaps see if it's possible to optically see it. If exactly, it's, if it's exactly. Okay. That's one of the things that okay. we've worked into the, the plans to the design. Um, with both the cameras on mm -hmm. Europa Clipper and yeah. the ultraviolet spectrograph, um, which will be much more sensitive. But there are a number of other ways that mm -hmm. we can look for current or recent mm -hmm. activity. Yeah. Um, in terms of, I mean, you can look directly for it. Mm -hmm. You can also look for thermal signatures mm -hmm. um, or what particulates. Does that mean? So you can look uh, to see if there's heat okay. um, coming from the surface. And yeah. in fact, um, there is some uh, some evidence that there may be heat in near the same region that the plume was seen. Correct? Yeah. So, so the plume we identified in this particular study fall within the general region that we call thermal anomaly that has been observed back again in the Galileo era, the, um, published by uh, scientists in the 1990s. 
And so uh, it appears to be that general region seems to have elevated temperature compared to the surroundings. Okay. And why is that interesting? If there's a, some, a, you know, a region of heat, uh, we're talking, of course, about ice, so it's, mm -hmm. you know, not hot, but hotter. But it's hot, it's hot for, it's for ice. It's hot yes. for ice. Yes. So yes. What, what is the significance of that thermal anomaly, so the, 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 this region of elevated temperatures? So, so that would tell us that the, um, it would give us information about how much activity there is, how okay. much heating. Yeah. Is, is going into Europa, how it's being focused. Mm -hmm. It also helps us um, understand the nature of the ice shell itself. Okay. Um, and one of the things we're particularly interested in is exchange processes mm -hmm. where we may get material like a plume, mm -hmm. where material is, is coming uh, from the ocean through the ice shell to the, um, uh, you know, out above Europa. And so it would be really important to understand the temperatures yeah. Um, of the material that's coming up, of the ice shell beneath it. Okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. Very cool. I wanted to thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much. Um, and we also, it looks like we have a question oh, uh, from the media here, a question from Will Dunham from Thomas Reuters. Uh, and the question is, uh, to what degree do these findings suggest that Europa possesses the conditions to harbor microbial or other life forms? And do these findings change your views about Europa as a leading candidate for hosting life? I'm going to direct that one to Zibi again, I think. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, well, we know that, that Europa has a lot of the ingredients um, necessary mm -hmm. uh, for life. Um, certainly for life as we know it, there's okay. liquid mm -hmm. water, there's energy, um, there's uh, some amount of, of carbon material, mm -hmm. um, but the habitability of Europa is one of the big questions yeah. that, we, that we want to understand. Yeah. And one of the really exciting things about detection of a plume is that that means uh, there may be ways that the material from the ocean, mm -hmm. which is Mm -hmm. likely the most habitable part yeah. of Europa because it's right. warmer right. and it's protected from the radiation environment okay. by the ice shell. So there, there may be ways for material from that ocean to come out um, above the, the ice shell and that means we'd be able to sample it. Yeah. Um, so that, that's one of the reasons this is so exciting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just to sort of back up about the Galileo um, data, was Galileo able to tell what was in the plume? Um, I think the data we have, the, the two data sets we analyzed uh, in this uh, study, magnetic field and, and the plasma wave data, okay. uh, they do not directly tell us the makeup uh, okay. of the plume, uh, okay. the composition of the plume. Okay. Uh, what we inferred was, you know, it's, it's likely, highly likely, this, given the composition of the uh, near surface material on Europa, and we think it's, you know, if it's a plume, it's, it's largely composed of uh, potentially of water. Okay, yeah. great. Cool. I think we have another question. All right. Um, another question from the media from Chris Gebhardt um, at nasaspaceflight.com. And the question is, uh, what kind of impact do you anticipate this having on the upco on upcoming Europa Clipper mission? And will any instruments or mission aspects be tweaked? And I think this is kind of a general question yeah. for all of us. I know Zibby's very heavily involved <laughs> in the Europa Clipper. She's actually leading the cameras on that mission. Um, so I'm sure she has thoughts, but I, I'm, I'm kind of opening it up. I'd like to know if other people think that uh, this could have an impact. I, I don't think it will tweak the instruments at this mm -hmm. point. Um, the instruments were specifically selected mm -hmm. to be able to search for and study exactly this kind of, of activity. Um, so we have the, the right instruments already on board. Whether or not the trajectory mm -hmm. can be tweaked so that the spacecraft flies closer to this area, that, I mean, we're obviously limited by the laws of physics, yep. um, so <laughs> can't, right. can't get to every part of the surface right. close up, but that, that's an area um, that would be able to tweak, as well, be tweaked. So as will well the as orbits the be able to get deep enough to get down and fly through the plumes again? So the closest approach the closest approach altitudes for Europa Clipper get down to 25 kilometers. Yeah. Wow. So they're very close. Now, whether wow. that 25 that's kilometers so can yeah. be done. <laughs> oh, my God. That's like, <laughs> bzz, bzz, yeah, like is, that is Oh, my really God. <laughs> so whether we can get that close in the region where the, the plume material yeah. has been detected um, is limited, again, by the trajectory um, of the spacecraft. Yeah. So I don't know if, I don't know if you've looked at how close uh, Clipper gets to that area. Um, I think I think in general, I, as far as I know, you know, as as uh, its current plan is, 
Clipper, as you just said, ZB, uh, will conduct more than 40 flybys, close flybys of Europa, and mm -hmm. I, and over 40 of them will have flyby altitudes cl at close approach uh, less than 400 kilometers high, and that certainly itself is good news yeah. because the plume we identified in this study, um, we saw the strong signal between the altitude, altitudinal range of 200 to 400 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So the closer you get to the surface, probably the chance you're seeing signatures of plume um, will be higher. So I think in that respect, mm -hmm. Clipper certainly is in a very good position. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, I think maybe the project, you know, it's, we have to look more carefully at, you know, which region uh, is being covered mm -hmm. by all these uh, very low altitude flybys. Right. Okay. Interesting. So it's less about the instruments changing and more about maybe where we send them or, you know. Right. And the observational yeah. strategy, right. The right. This, observational this gives strategy. us a, an initial place to right. start looking. I yeah. mean, obviously, right. we, the plan was to do as, as global a search as yeah. possible for for plumes, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but this gives us a place to target initially. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, what certainly. kinds of things are we actually looking for in those plumes? Is where we're so talking about the ability to fly through the plumes <laughs> and identify that the plumes are there, um, but what types of measurements are we making other than just looking at them, but are we taking chemical measurements mm -hmm. and trying to understand uh, what type of chemistry is going on in those plumes and do we have the ability to say yes there is microbial life or yes there's oh. a potential for microbial <laughs> oh, life. So that's a question. <laughs> that's that's only. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Do, we do have instrumentation to be able to detect particles, to be able to make mm -hmm. chemical measurements. There's a mass spectrometer that would be able to tell what mm -hmm. the chemical components of, of the plume or right. the atmosphere mm -hmm. of Europa. Europa has a very tenuous atmosphere but nonetheless there's material there and so we'd be able to look at that right? Um, and we'd be able to detect dust particles, we'll get um, information about composition. Mm -hmm. But it's a long stretch to go from being able to measure the specific composition to being able to do <laughs> yeah. I know, I know, yeah. it's a big jump. Yes. That's oh. a really, yeah. and I think it's important for us to all really understand just how yes. hard that is mm. to do yeah. to actually say we've detected something right. that's alive. Yeah. That's a really big jump, yeah. right? Absolutely. So we have to take the steps in order to get there, right? Yeah. Right. To get yeah. all yeah. the way to that. Unless, you know, we put a GoPro on it and see the flying <laughs> space lizards, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if only. If only. <laughs> uh, so we have another question here. This is from Twitter user Manish. He asks, uh, why is Europa considered by many to be the most likely place in the solar system to find life? Great so question. It's a yeah. good question. Um, it is certainly one of the, you know, a high probability mm -hmm. location in the solar system, but certainly not the only location that right. we've identified right. in the solar right. system that could potentially uh, right. be a place where life is harbored. Mm -hmm. So just some thoughts there. Well, we know there's liquid water, and that's, of course, for life as we know it, mm -hmm. um, it required, right. mm -hmm. and so that's right. that's one of the reasons. And at uh, at Europa, the liquid water is fairly close to the surface. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but the, but as you say, there are a number of places in the outer solar system right. that mm -hmm. uh, may may be habitable. Enceladus has a similar um, you know liquid water exactly ocean that yeah. is that is venting. Um, Which one's bigger? I always forget that. Enceladus, Enceladus is much smaller. smaller. Okay, yeah. is much okay. smaller. Right. Yes. So just to kind of review so Enceladus and Titan are both mm -hmm. moons of Saturn right so they're a little bit further out yeah but um, you know do you think it we're more likely to find life on Europa than at Enceladus or Titan or is it uh, fairly even or or is it's, it just more challenging in some of the other environments? It's, yeah. Oh, it's hard to say. I mean, that's one of the reasons that, that habitability is such a, a key thing yeah. to study. Mm -hmm. um, because we really, right now, have only the one data point. Right. And so what we want to do is gather more data points. And exactly. we have mm -hmm. different environments at these places. Yeah. Uh, Titan, for example, um, has a very rich, uh, very rich carbon chemistry. And so it's, it's kind of a carbon world yeah. um, as well as an, an ocean world. And so that, that's a different dimension in terms of the question right. of habitability. Yeah. So we have a great question from Facebook user Antonia, which is related to what we were just talking about, which is, are the plumes generated by the same physical causes as on Enceladus? So we were talking about, we know there's plumes yeah. on Enceladus. We now have plumes on Europa that are confirmed. So is it the same physical process yeah. that's, that's causing these plumes? And maybe we can start by by uh, talking about what are those processes? Right. You know, what do we think is causing the plumes, and mm -hmm. is that maybe also happening on Europa? Right. Okay. So, uh, 
Shinjo, yeah, I think there there have think? been there have been uh, suggestions, you know, theories, um, models being put mm -hmm. out, trying to understand, the, for example, in Enceladus, why plumes exist. At Enceladus, you know, there were um, the the uh, suggestion has been, you know, this tidal uh, flexing. Right. Uh, the, right. When you have a ice cover floating above a liquid layer, and as the moon is orbiting around its parent planet, I mean, Enceladus to Saturn, and at Europa, we're talking about Jupiter. So it changes its distance relative to the parent planet. Mm -hmm. So this uh, flexing is changing as well. So depending on the orbital phase, how close and how far the moon is away from the planet, you might see at some locations, uh, it's, it's squeezing, trying to mm -hmm. squeeze the, the moon and making right. uh, this material coming out into space. Mm -hmm. And that has been, I think, fairly well established at, uh, at the Enceladus when Cassini t uh, sent back uh, a lot of data that allow scientists to, to see this correlation to the orbit. Right, at, at different places in the orbit, yeah. there's more of an there's eruption. There's more of an eruption right. than right. other yeah, places. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing we still don't quite understand, I think, at, at the Europa, because right. there's right. a very sparse, very few data points we have right. so far. Yeah. Um, and when you say this, the flexing sort of squeezes the material out, do you mean like, like, you know, squeezing a toothpaste tube and the toothpaste comes out, you know, it's kind of squeezing the, you know, what's... It's, I think it's more a case that, that when there's extension in okay. that region, when the, when the crust is stretched, yeah. it allows material to escape. Gotcha. And then when there's gotcha. compression, when it's being pushed together, there's less material that escapes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. Right, right, gotcha. right. We've got another great question here. We've got lots of good questions. A uh, question from the media, Jesse Shanahan from Forbes Science. Uh, what is causing the unusual heating in this specific region? So this is another great question for Shinjo. Yeah. Just, uh, I, um, see that there's, it's warmer there, but what, warmer, what do we yeah, think yeah. is happening? Yeah. I think, I think the exact origin of my understanding of, of reading, you know, the, the literature has been um, the, the exact origin of why this particular region seems to be warmer than uh, other places is not really very well understood. There are, uh, I think, different models, theories being put out uh, trying to explain this uh, uh, thermal anomaly. Uh, mm -hmm. could be internal, and uh, but also could be tied to the surface material. The thermal uh, uh, properties are different uh, due to uh, other processes. So I don't really, uh, I don't think we really know exact origin of, of uh, the anomaly uh, at this yeah. this particular region. Or how long lived it is. Yeah, how long don't it lived, know. Yes, right. exactly. That's a, that's a yeah. good point. Yeah. That's yeah. a very good point. Yeah. Although the comparison, being able to compare the Galileo data to the upcoming Clipper data will give us a bit of a, you know, not, a, not geologic, time scale yeah, right. but you know but a few decades worth sure. to compare and yes. look for changes yeah. and so that's right. going to be very interesting as absolutely well. yes yeah we've got another great question here uh, Facebook user Sarah asks uh, to clarify are these pop-up storms um, so looking at the radar now won't be helpful in determining timing the timing of the storms so I guess of the eruptions, right? Of the yeah, the right plumes, of the plumes. right of the plumes. Right. I think that's right. what we're talking yeah. about here. Yeah. So then, you yeah. know, first to clarify, you know, there's yeah. this isn't like a weather phenomenon happening. We aren't getting thunderstorms or anything like we no. said earlier. No. Europa has a very tenuous atmosphere. So what's actually happening is these. I don't. I know some people say guys are like. Uh, sort of eruptions of, of water are coming mm -hmm. out of the actual surface of Europa. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so you know, can we use uh, data to look at the timing of the eruption. Right. Now, and we can we can do models, for example, to look at how long it would take to heat up that much of the crust. Yeah. You know, the the area that we see. If it's something that's penetrating the entire crust, which at Europa is twenty five plus or minus something yeah. kilometers Meaning thick. coming from, right? if directly it's coming from, from the, the ocean, ocean and going all the, the way up. Yeah, outside okay. of Europa, um, it's not it's not going to be as ephemeral as, you know, as, as storms or something like right, that because right. it takes a long time to, right. to break through right. the crust. So if it's not coming from it the could, ocean, what is the alternative? Where else could it ah, be? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. There, there could be... Um, <clears throat> diapirs, 
um, or areas in the crust where warm water has uh -huh. risen up in okay. the crust yeah. um, and is closer to the surface. Yeah. And there are some areas, we call it chaos terrain, yes. that are just, Ooh. oh, they're just spectacular. That's a cool on name. Europa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if you look at them, they you can see their plates of Europa, the oh, shell, okay. and you can see how they've moved around wow. on top of this region. Yeah. And so that suggests that there has been mobile right. material, okay. possibly liquid water, a depth that they've been able yeah. to move around on, like like icebergs yeah. um, in the you know in the sea here. On so Earth. if I before we go to the next question, uh -huh. if I could, f so I think one of the things I had trouble wrapping my mind around was cryovolcanism versus the volcanism that we're very familiar with. Right. So is the so you have you know the ocean down there, and then maybe some kind of isolated spots of warmer water closer maybe mm -hmm. is there an is there an, an analogy you could use for you know where magma is on earth is it like a hot spot versus you know a magma chamber under a volcano i mean i'm i don't know this so, might not be the right crowd to ask <laughs> so <laughs> one of the what is that i'm trying to imagine right. yeah one of the complications is that we don't know what's under the sure. ocean, okay. right? And we don't yeah. know if the interior of Europa, for example, looks like Io, which mm -hmm. has large yeah. silicate volcanoes. Right. And so if there is volcanism under the ocean, the same, the same way we have sub-ocean yeah. volcanism on Earth, then that could be one of the, region, the reasons that you get regions of heat. Okay, yeah. But, but that's, just, uh, that's yeah, something we have we no idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. that would be really exciting. So are yeah. you able, uh, a question for Shinja here, are you able to, uh, I guess, how well can you localize where these uh, plumes are coming out? To what kind of size scale do you think the, the, mm -hmm. where the plume openings are? How many plumes and how, how yeah. can you, are you able to, characterize them in that way? Yes, that's something definitely we had to uh, spend some time looking at uh, in, in doing this study. So when we first saw the data, um, the magnetic field data and plasma wave measurements, mm -hmm. and we you know, spotted out this three minute long signal. Uh, mm -hmm. That seems to be very unusual mm -hmm. compared to uh, all the other flyby data we have looked right, at near right. Europa. Um, and again, you know, based on the knowledge we learned from studying Enceladus, you know, we know, you know when you have a plume in outer space, uh, they're able to influence the magnetic field. They're mm -hmm. able to influence the plasma environment. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the uh, information, the background knowledge we already had mm -hmm. from, from studying Enceladus. Right. And that guided us through our analysis. And But to really make sense of the data, to really interpret the data, we had to go for numerical modeling. And it's exactly right. during the numerical modeling we had to test different pool models in terms of location, in terms of its size in ah. terms of its uh, density, mm -hmm. column density, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. and, and I think luckily, you know, Hubble images are very, very valuable in that sense because you can see from those images how big uh, roughly the, the plumes are. And right. they also tell us, you know, they infer column densities uh, for the uh, potentially detected plumes. So we use those as constraints in our numerical mm -hmm. uh, computer model. And we test a large number of plume models with the same kind of characteristics we saw in the Hubble images. And the one we find out, this one that seems to have a very good match to the observations uh, for the magnetic signal and the plasma wave emissions. Very cool. So, so Galileo spent three minutes within the, the plume, or is it three minutes of data and the, the, part, the, the amount of time it spent within the plume is narrower than that? The, uh, the magnetic signal seem, uh, definitely shows a, uh, a, uh, a bend or uh -huh. a, a twist of the magnetic field ah. about three minutes long. Okay. And wow. so not only the okay. magnetic field strength changes abruptly, it goes up and, and drops very okay. quickly within uh -huh. that three minutes, cool. but also its direction, you know, because the magnetometer is able to yes. tell us the yeah. direction right. of the magnetic field. And it also showed the very strength, the bending, the yeah. bend of the field mm -hmm. lines. Interesting. And that's one of the things we, you know, you see in the, in the, in the image we just put out. And the plasma wave emissions are able to tell us there seems to be localized uh, m more dense plasma in that in that around the uh -huh. uh, same time when we see the magnetic signal. Wow! And um, and how far do you know how far Galileo moved in that in that three minute? Time yeah, as, as Margaret uh, mentioned, you know we know the speed of the space right. at the time is about yeah. six kilometers per second. So that three minute long interval corresponds to about a thousand kilometers. Okay. Wow! Space wow! That's then. big. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at, at this altitude, at yeah. this about two to yeah. four hundred kilometers wow. high. That's amazing. right, which so means that it could be even. Broader, closer to the surface. Uh, yes, probably, yeah. yes. 
We have another question from the media here, and this is kind of following on to a question we were talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, the question is uh, from Mark Corot, Aviation Week, and Eric Niller from Wired have similar questions. Uh, will Clipper have a means of detecting biomarkers, and how might the instruments compare to the ones on Cassini? So we've already talked a little bit about the mm -hmm. ability to detect mm -hmm. biomarkers, but it's a good question about how the instruments yeah. are similar or different from what flew on Cassini, because Cassini did uh, right. fly through the plumes on Enceladus and made some observations there as well. So it right. be interesting. Can we? Like, like Cassini, uh, mm -hmm. Europa Clipper has a, a suite of, of instruments mm -hmm. um, that are designed to work together to understand, in this case, Europa right. as, a, as a system. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those instruments are remote sensing instruments like cameras, um, spectrometers, mm -hmm. Um, that measure things from afar, mm -hmm. and then others are, are instruments that measure things um, in situ or, or in place, right in the environment mm -hmm. of the spacecraft, like a magnetometer or the plasma instrument mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the uh, mass spectrometer, for example. One of the big differences is that Clipper has um, a sounding radar. Oh, so right. that allows us to get to um, to get information about the subsurface structure oh, of so Europa. Yeah, so you, can you talk about that just a little bit yeah. more? So Cassini carried a radar right. um, that could see the surface, right? But a sounding radar can actually uh, measure and see what's going on beneath the surface. Can you exactly. talk about that a little exactly. bit more? So, so it's designed to be able to, um, it, it sends out signals and is sensitive to, at, at wavelengths that will penetrate into the ice. Yeah. And then it is sensitive to um, detect the, how those signals return mm -hmm. and yeah. where they reflect in the crust will give us information. For example, if there is liquid water that's perched okay. up closer to the surface yeah. than the ocean, that would be something one mm -hmm. would be, hope to be able to detect with a with a sounding radar. So is it that you know this uh, you know beam? Is it light or it's actually no? Like it's a, a much it's a or longer wavelength. Oh, okay. So this beam of something <laughs> goes down, and is it does it move um, or I guess does it travel at different speeds? Whether it's you know solid ice or liquid. I mean, how do you tell the difference between the different structures? Right, right. So the the um, the simplest thing to think about is that that you'll you'll send a signal, mm -hmm. and there'll be a reflection off the surface. Okay. Right, and so that's that's very mm -hmm. easy to think yeah. about because it reflects off the surface, and you receive it, mm -hmm. which gives you a measurement of the altimetry of the topography yes. of the surface. Yes. Um, but then, but then you're exactly right. Okay. The, there will be waves that penetrate into the surface, yeah. and you can detect when they come back, uh -huh. which tells how far how how far they penetrated, how okay. they were reflected, and okay. how they were reflected yeah. back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. Oh, I'm that so excited. Really yeah. Great. And so, but we don't have that necessarily for Enceladus. Is that Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. We didn't. Uh, Cassini had a, a different type of a radar, as radar. you oh. said, that was designed to do synthetic aperture radar imaging. Okay. Um, so that does surface imaging, um, but doesn't do yeah. deep, um, deep uh, sounding. Okay. Um, you know, so, it would only yeah. penetrate. Um, you know tens of centimeters, well, actually, to be fair, it, it actually penetrated into, you know, little bit. hundreds of meters into yeah. the, the uh, methane seas on Titan. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, but what the radar on Clipper is designed mm -hmm. to do is penetrate kilometers into the ice into shell the ice. so that we can understand oh the, the ice shell. <laughs> yeah, that's it's really cool. That's so cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> that's great. Chills again. Wow. <laughs> that's great. That's great. We've got another question from social media, and I think right. this is a great uh, philosophical question for us to consider awesome. here. Uh, Facebook user Steve asks, could there be non-carbon-based life with completely different requirements for existence? Oh my God. This is always a great question <laughs> is, because yeah. the only life we know is the life we yep. know, yeah, <laughs> which right? is ours. Oh. Um, and so we, we think we understand uh, what we're made of and what it takes for mm -hmm. us to live, but, right. uh, but what what other ideas are out there? Could there be, you know, how do we know what we don't know that we're looking exactly. for? Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a great that's question. Quite a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if anyone wants to, you know, speculate, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I don't think I know enough to. Well, for, for you know. water based life, the yeah. water is a solvent. Mm -hmm. um, that that enables the mm -hmm. um, materials to combine, yeah. right. and there are other solvents, yeah. and so it's quite possible to sure. to think that there sure. might be life based on on the other solvents as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the lakes of Titan, methane and ethane and 
right. lots of other things, uh, you know, those aren't water. So if there's life there, then it would be... Right. It, it's possible different. that there might yeah. be places different. where there are methane-based life yeah. forms. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Woo. But, <laughs> but that's still carbon-based. <laughs> oh, it's that's carbon-based, carbon but, but it's not water-based. But not water. Uh, not right. water. Right, 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 yes. right. Yeah. Yeah, so it right. would require liquid mm. water to yes. exist. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. that's the difference. Sorry, yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it is what else <laughs> other than carbon? Yes, could there yeah. be. I mean, I, it's yes. hard to imagine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I have no idea. Interesting question. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Address that. Good question. Uh, we have another question from the media. This is from Bart Leahy, is Space Flight Insider. Uh, how close will Europa Clipper get to Europa, and how many passes will it make by the moon? Cool. Uh, the, the nominal mission design that we have right now um, has over 40. Right now we have 44 close flybys cool. mm -hmm. of Europa, and um, many of those get down below 100 kilometers, and uh, several are down at the 25 kilometer altitude, yeah. just screaming over the surface. Yeah, Which is about exciting. 15 miles, I looked yeah. it up. Yeah. That, <laughs> is, that is mind-bogglingly yeah. close. Yeah. I mean, that is... Yeah. What is 15 miles away from DC? You know, I mean, just like, <laughs> right? Do, do we uh, have? Can we give yeah, a? Can we give a it's reference it's here? Less than a, it's less than a DC to Annapolis, I think. Yeah. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's. Yeah, I, I commuted that's further like, this morning into. Yeah, like that's yeah, yeah. very close. Yes. I mean, that's so cool. Yeah. That is really amazing. <laughs> but that allows us yeah. to, you know, to look at the surface um, in very close detail. Yeah. Um, and it makes it uh, easier to measure the atmosphere because there'll be mm -hmm. more material mm -hmm. closer to Europa. Um, if there are plumes, the, the further down into them, the, the better yeah. sensing yeah. of the, the material. The closer the source region, the better. Yeah. Exactly. And that's also better for measuring the magnetic field, exactly. too. Exactly, yes. Yeah. If you get too far away from the plume proper, let's say there is indeed plume, then the signals will be contaminated with other effects. You know, mm -hmm. the plasma is interacting with Europa constantly. So if you're uh, too far away from the plume region, uh, you may not have the chance to really uh, tell a lot about the plume. And what different aspects of the plume can you find out from getting that close? And will you, would you be able to see you know, material falling back onto the planet, you know, or excuse me, the moon? The moon. Right. <laughs> well, one of the challenges of Europa compared to, say, Enceladus mm -hmm. is that Europa is much bigger. So there's a lot more gravity. Mm -hmm. So when you see these images of Enceladus with the plumes stretching yeah. out almost as far above Enceladus as Enceladus is large, that's possible because there's so little gravity holding yeah, material yeah. back. But on Europa, material won't be able to get as high, mm -hmm. um, especially some of the particulate material. So being able to fly lower mm -hmm. through the plume gets you closer to the source and therefore makes it possible, hopefully, to, cool. to sample more of the material cool. that's coming out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've got a question for Margaret. She's with us here. Um, and so, Margaret, uh, could you talk a little bit more about um, the magnetic field and the measurements that you took when you were at Europa. And, and Shunjun has talked uh, a little bit about uh, the magnetic signal that he saw in the plumes, but just kind of in general, what's the magnetic field like um, at Europa? And how many places in our solar system do we have a magnetic field? Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Let's start with how many places do we have magnetic fields? Not all of the planets have planetary magnetic fields. so. Um, Mars doesn't have a, a planetary magnetic field. Venus doesn't have a planetary magnetic field. But little Mercury does, So, uh, and all of the giant planets. And as the Galileo uh, made multiple orbits through the uh, Jupiter system, uh, we established how the field varies with space and time. And then we found each time we came close to one of the big moons, the field deviated from what had been uh, uh, present if the moon hadn't been there. And it's almost as if a boat is going through the water and that pushes the water to the side and makes waves on the side. So as the... the um, yeah, the material of Jupiter's environment encounters one of these moons. It gets diverted, it gets slowed, and the magnetic field changes magnitude and bends, and we can relate 
all of those changes to properties of the moons. Wow, that is amazing, yeah. And so how does the plume interact? Is it interacting with the magnetic field? I mean, how, do we, how are we using the magnetic field to actually, and the plasma environment to find the plume? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question, because the material that is coming out from Europa is probably electrically neutral. It's probably dominated by water vapor, which is a neutral material. But there are lots of energetic particles in the environment of Europa, and they ionize the material that is coming off. So they make it an electrically charged material, which can carry currents. And it's those electrical, electrically charged parts of the plume that cause the changes in the magnetic field that Shinja modeled so well and change the density of the electrons in the environment that were measured by the plasma wave instrument. So it's, it's, it's not a direct uh, effect on the environment from the plume. It's a two-step process. Wow, thank you so much, Margaret, yeah, that's great. You. We've got another question uh, from social media. This is a Twitter user, Deepak, asks, uh, what's the temperature on Europa and can bacteria survive at those temperatures? And we haven't really quite mm -hmm. got this question from that angle yet. Mm -hmm. So what do we know about the bacteria and could they actually <laughs> survive at the temperatures that we think right. Europa? Well, the surface temperature is quite cold. Um, right. So, bit. Just a little well, how chilly. cold now, is quite uh, yeah. cold? How cold is quite cold? Um, I don't remember the solar. I can. I mean, yeah, I, I can do that right here. Right here. Let's Let's see. See. Uh, it's hundred, uh, about hundred. Thank you. A hundred Kelvin, yeah, about Kelvin, Kelvin, which uh, is uh, minus one hundred and seventy-three in Celsius. And you're gonna have to figure out what that is in Fahrenheit for me. Let's see. But but that's pretty darn cold. But how cold do we? How we? We've talked about it being warmer in the water. Clearly, it's a liquid water. Yes. And in part, it could be colder than the freezing temperature of water because it could have salts and other right. types of chemicals in the, in the water. So it could be a little right. colder than, than water. But, but, uh, but we know there, there are bacteria on Earth that mm -hmm. can survive in, in very extreme temperatures. Sure. Yeah. Um, and certainly liquid water in the mm -hmm. interior of Europa um, would probably be quite toasty for, for some of those. <laughs> um, okay. For some of those okay. bacteria. Um, whether, whether there are levels in the, you know, in the ice um, where things ah, can survive, right. that's a, that would, that's that's a good a question, question too. Yeah, right, question to right, right. Well, we do know of one extremely cold place that life yes. can survive, right? Lake Vostok, Lake Vostok yeah. right, mm -hmm. in Antarctica, correct? Right, right, yeah. beneath the ice shell. Yeah, ice shell so do Antarctica. we, let's see, just, you know, my quick <laughs> internet searching here, <laughs> it's about minus, what, 80, 90 um, degrees Celsius. Celsius. So, okay. you know, we know there's some extremophile cold bacteria right. in there. Okay. Some mi maybe not bacteria, some microbes right. mm -hmm. um, down there. So I guess that's a start, Good. right? Good. Good. All right, we've got another question. Great questions. Uh, Twitter user Jason Major uh, is asking, what sort of effect might Europa's plume activity have on other Ooh. nearby moons surfaces. So that's a great question. So Shinja, you've looked at these plumes at how high they are and a sense of how big they are. You know, is there a sense or a, an, a way for that material to, to yeah, stay and a, perhaps be transported uh, to another moon? That's a really system? excellent question. I think there are, um, um, you know, Europa has also in the past been found to be a source of neutral particles, you mm -hmm. know, around the orbit of the moon. And it has always been the puzzling uh, piece of information, the observation we had, you know, how to interpret um, the existence of seemingly a, a neutral cloud around Europa. I mean, we have long been thinking of Io as the major uh, source of, <laughs> of plasma to the Jovian environment. But it's just spewing, spewing stuff spewing out, out right? Yeah, yeah. volcanoes, <laughs> volcanic material into space. But the Europa also seems to um, be important also in terms of providing neutral material. So we have to understand, you know, the link between maybe uh, whether or not plumes are 
are, are responsible for those type of uh, okay. phenomena we saw in the past. Okay. It's a great question. Yeah, I think it needs yeah. to be good. Asked. And we Good. certainly see that in the Saturnian system. Sure. Enceladus is the source of the sure. the E-ring. But yes, right. also Io in the and Jovian. Yes. So there's, yeah. there's certainly a lot of exchange of material mm -hmm. sure. between sure. satellites at times. So I have another question for Margaret. Um, and this question, Margaret, is back when uh, you were working on designing and developing the magnetometer for Galileo, and then the mission flew, and it was uh, you know, flying around Jupiter and, and visiting Europa, did you ever anticipate these types of discoveries would be made uh, with the Galileo data? You know, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how hard it is to anticipate something that just hasn't happened before. Even discovering that um, Ganymede had a planetary magnetic field, one of the, the biggest moon of Jupiter had a magnetic field, was that was really quite a surprise, discovering that we had signatures that seemed to require a sub-ice ocean at Europa. Again, uh, it, had been, it had been discussed as a possibility. So it, we, were, we were aware of the possibility, but it was certainly not of something that we thought was highly probable. And then when we saw that there really was a signature of an ocean, it was quite an aha moment. So um, no, I, I don't think I would have anticipated this and certainly not anticipated that we'd be finding out about plumes 20 years after we acquired the data. <laughs> That's amazing. That's just I, just incredible to have, be involved in those types of uh, incredible discoveries. Yeah. Thank you so much. Margaret. Um, we've got, I think, a few more minutes uh, left for some of our discussion, and then we've got a video to kind of close out yeah. um, our, our hour here. Yeah. So uh, maybe a few other topics. Uh, well, or one thing I w want to ask what people want, what you would like the people that are listening and watching, mm -hmm. what you'd like them to take away from, from this discussion and what we've learned yeah, uh, from, the, from these so go ahead, Shinja. Yeah. So the one thing I, I feel uh, extremely excited about was, you know, um, having seen now this uh, uh, result from our uh, our paper, uh, really strengthened the case that I mean, when you look also at the Hubble uh, images, mm -hmm. uh, uh, combining the two, kind of a, a two uh, independent uh, piece of evidence, that now really strengthens the case that Europa seems to have plumes, and that really uh, yeah, I think is, provides a great opportunity for future exploration mm -hmm. uh, of Europa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, and I've got a quick media question. They want us to squeeze in oh, here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We close out. Mm -hmm. So how important is it to send a probe back to Enceladus to get comparative data? And this is from Marcia Smith at Space Policy on Online, and this is a great question. Mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so we're saying after Europa. Cooper. After Europa, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one. Or of, that's one of the exciting things in the in the outer solar system is the diversity mm -hmm. of the the types of objects we've seen, and we today have only talked about the moons of Jupiter mm -hmm. and Saturn. Only right. a few of the moons, right? right. Only right. a few right. of those, right? right. So and many. the the diversity of objects and the questions we have about about moons as we get further out mm -hmm. in the solar system yeah. about um, Ariel at Uranus and Triton at at Neptune. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, territory out there, yeah. a lot of terra inc yeah. incognita that would be yeah. really yeah. exciting to explore. There is. Including and Enceladus. Oh. Yeah, and it's, and it's more than just an exploration. You know, a lot of what we do in planetary science is comparing mm. different yes. places yeah. to each other, things that are similar and things that are different. We take, it's yeah. a lot of what we do. We look at how things work on Earth, and then we look at the other planets yeah. and make sure that, you know, we understand how things are working there. Um, so this is a big part of our approach. So certainly yeah. getting to Enceladus would be fantastic. Very, very yeah, powerful to technique to, yeah. Yeah. to do that comparison. Yeah, yes, yeah. Awesome. that would be great. That would be great. Yeah. Um, so again, let's uh, go back to Zibby here and see if you have some takeaway things that you'd really like people to, uh, to take away from, from this discussion, from this new discovery, why it's so important to you and uh, you know, going forward. Well, I think it, it really demonstrates how much um, how much we are, you know, leveraging future um, 
exploration and discoveries on, on past data sets. And um, how, how much richness there is if we go back to data sets yeah. with a new context, mm -hmm. right? With the HST data suggesting yeah. there might be something there, going back and reanalyzing that shows us something, uh, something we hadn't seen in the, in the data before yeah. and something we didn't know. And it, uh, you know, and, and, and taking that in the context of Cassini, it just yeah. shows the, the steps we're taking moving forward. Yeah. But it also just really whets our appetite for what we're going to be able <laughs> yeah. to have at, uh, at Europa. We're yeah. so ready. We're so <laughs> ready. Exactly. We're and so I mean, if ready. we're finding this stuff now, what, 20 years later, I mean, w what else could we right? find? I mean, how much yeah. more data is there to, you know, sort of mine through? Yep. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, so <laughs> Shinja, what are you going to discover next? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, a lot of things to be, to be mm -hmm. learned, I think, in the, in the old data set. Yeah, so definitely yeah. one thing I learned yeah. from, this, uh, from this study. Yeah. 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 A lot of surprises. A yeah. lot of yep. surprises that the... The old data are still incredibly useful, yes. right? Yes. The new data are great, but the, the old data are also, they hold a lot of yeah. secrets we haven't yet uncovered. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yes. so yes. thank you so much for yeah. your work. You're welcome. Okay, I, I want to thank uh, our audience, the listening audience. I want to mm -hmm. thank uh, the social media and mm -hmm. all of the uh, media for participating and sending in questions. There were some great questions. We really enjoyed sitting here and yeah. talking about them. Yeah. We could and talk for another hour. <laughs> we could, could I could talk about this <laughs> yes. forever. Very, very fascinating. <laughs> the result is absolutely incredible okay. to, to be able to say we really are confident there are plumes on Europa and have a mission that's really already in development yeah. going yeah. and ready to make those measurements is fantastic. Yep. So to close this out, we're going to, to leave it with another video with our uh, ad Associate Administrator for our Science at NASA. It'll be Thomas Serbukin. Today's announcement of yet more evidence of plumes jetting out of Europa marks an outstanding leap forward in our search for life and habitable environments in the solar system. There were hints of plumes in the past from the Hubble Space Telescope but today's finding, which was mined from over decade-old data, gives us further evidence to sink our scientific teeth into. The fact that Galileo flew right through a plume tells us that on Europa, these plumes are common and calling us to explore. Europa has long been a high priority for exploration because it holds a salty liquid water ocean beneath its icy crust. In just a few years, the Europa Clipper spacecraft will be sailing towards that ocean world, equipped with the instruments necessary to investigate both the origins and the plumes and what ingredients they contain. Europa Clipper's ultimate aim is to determine whether Europa is habitable, possessing the ingredients we believe are necessary for life as we know it, liquid water, chemical ingredients, and an energy source. Europa's ocean is one of the most promising places that could potentially harbor life in the solar system. These newly confirmed plumes will provide another way to sample this vast ocean. Are we getting closer to answering? Are we alone in the universe? The simple answer is yes. Perhaps that answer might come from a small ocean world like Europa. Thanks for watching. <laughs>